This talk is about prenatal screening and diagnosis. It sort of builds off the general uh, prenatal lecture that we had earlier on. So we're going to go over screening, kind of a quick review of that, talk about some of the invasive and not the non-invasive way to um, diagnostic techniques as well. So as a general disclaimer, this is just information for thinking about and for education. It's not for uh, treating patients, treating yourself. If you have any sort of problems, make sure to see a medical person and take good care of yourself. So the point of doing this prenatal screening and diagnosis is to detect or diagnose the problem with organogenesis or genetic abnormality with the hope that you could then inform a therapeutic intervention or um, a termination decision. All right, and then so screening is a risk estimate. Now, it needs to be differentiated from diagnosis. So screening, you could take someone... Let's say you have a person who's greater than 35, so they're advanced maternal age, AMA. They come in, and they're so they're at like moderate high risk of having some sort of problem. Then you do a screening test, and you could say, okay, now they're moved from moderate risk to very high risk or extremely high risk, but you still haven't made a diagnosis. To make a diagnosis, you need to get fetal DNA. We're talking about for genetic and chromosomal problems. Get fetal DNA and do an analysis on that, like a karyotype or a fish or some sort of analysis that allows you to then say, okay, to tr try some 21 or try some 18, or you have some sort of... Um, specific diagnosis for what the problem is. All right, so you can think about that the same way you would with cancer. Somebody who has the symptoms of, uh, of lung cancer, they have a finding on imaging, they come in, they are very high risk of having lung cancer, but they don't have lung cancer until you've um, made a tissue diagnosis. I would, I would use the same um, type of thinking when you think about prenatal screening versus prenatal diagnosis. You need the DNA um, for diagnosis. All right, and so the first trimester screening, this is for strictly for aneuploid screening, so trisomy 21 and 18 is a very simple two-step approach you can use to figure this out. So you've nuchal translucency increased. That means you have some sort of problem going on. Nuchal translucency, that's like the looking at the fluid around the neck. So that's up in all the trisomies. So that's step one. You follow that up with step two. And you say, is, is the HDG increased or not? If HDG is also increased, then you're talking about tri trisomy 21. If it's decreased, then you're th thinking about 18 Edwards. And the reason that this early screening is important because if you detect a problem earlier and that changes management, maybe there's going to be a termination, you can do that um, more safely with less complications in the first trimester of pregnancy with dilation curatage as opposed to later on in pregnancy when you need to use um, more invasive risky procedure like the uh, dilation and evacuation. All right, and then another thing to emphasize is that this is aneuploidy screening for these certain aneuploidies. It's not testing for every genetic problem. So if someone says, oh, I'm you know, low risk after this screening test, well, that's for these two things, right? It's not for everything. So you could have, even for some aneuploids, you have a sex chromosome amazo uh, aneuploidy like um, Turner's or Kleinfelder's. This test isn't talking about that. So you could still have um, aneuploidy or other genetic problems regardless of what this test shows. So moving on to the um, second part of screening, the second mainstay of screening is the quad screen. It's happening later on in the pregnancy. And if you combine um, the initial first trimester screening with the quad screening, you get what's called sequential screening, and that increases the sensitivity greater than either would be the, by themselves. It gets up to the, above 95%. All right, in the quad screen, you can also use um, a fairly simple two-step approach to evaluate what you've got here. So you start out with um, the AFP, so that's the maternal serum AFP, MSAFP. The way to think about the AFP is it's an alpha fetal protein. So it's a fetal protein. When there's, the neural tube doesn't close correctly, that's like a hole. So that fetal protein can leak out, go into the amniotic fluid, and get into the placental circulation. I mean, get into the maternal um, circulation through the placenta. Okay, so if, that, if there's a neural tube defect, then the alpha fetal protein will be increased. That makes sense based on what we said. And then also, um, fortunately, from, for diagnosis or for um, screening purposes, the AFP is decreased in the trisomies. So if you have trisomy 21 or 18, you'll have a decreased AFP. So that's where you start out. Are you talking about a neural tube problem or a trisomy problem? And you look at the AFP to figure that out. So let's say you're, you've, um, the AFP is decreased. Now you're talking about trisomies. And you use the same rule as before, step two before, to figure out if you're talking about 21 or 18. So look at the HCG. If the HCG is increased, you're talking about trisomy 21 down. So if it's decreased, um, you're talking about Edwards. So ultrasound, going over the r routine indications for ultrasound. So the initial one could be at the initial visit to help with dating. Let's say LMP is uncertain. You can do ultrasound to help with dating and also confirm confirm an IUP, intrauterine pregnancy. So it could be the initial routine ultrasound. That can Another routine ultrasound can come again between 18 and 20 weeks. This is the anatomic ultrasound when you're making the measurements. And this is a screening type of test looking for problems with organogenesis or other congenital problems.
And the third time you just use an ultrasound in a normal pregnancy is after 36 weeks or when someone's in labor and trying to figure out the presentation. Do a quick ultrasound to make sure they're not breech. So ultrasound is good for looking at uh, many of the problems with organogenesis. So for example, um, renal problems, we're just going to focus on a few, th a few things here. So renal problems, potters as renal agenesis. It could also be bilateral obstruction. So bilateral renal, renal agenesis, you're not making you're not making amniotic fluid. We also have bilateral obstruction. You're still not getting the, um, the fluid out, the amniotic fluid out. So in either case, you have essentially low or very no or no um, amniotic fluid, which sets you up for the contractures and the lung hypoplasia that go along with potters. So it's good to, to know about just for the renal amniotic fluid connection. And also, ultrasound allows you to measure the amniotic fluid volume. That's the AFV. And the output you get from the, the measurements that you take the ultrasonographer does is a thing called the amniotic fluid index, the AFI. And that's going to divide you into all oligohydramnios, normal, or polyhydramnios. So less than 5 centimeters is oligo, not enough. Normal up to 25, greater than 25, now you're too much, is polyhydramnios. Um, all right, so I think that covers why um, ultrasound is especially important for, for renal things, because of the connection between the amniotic fluid and the kidneys. Now, neural tube defects, the important thing to remember about these is that they're very early. The neural tube starts to close at around four weeks, developmental age, or six weeks, gestational age. Remember, gestational age is based on um, LMP, so it's about four weeks, four weeks longer than developmental age. And the key thing there is the um, periconceptual uh, folate supplementation to, to prevent that from happening. All right, and now cardiac defects, the common ones are, like, for example, ventral septal defects, very most common. There's also astrology of flow among a, a whole bunch of other ones. So cardiac defects can be evaluated with echo. Echocardiogram can be used, and you want to use those for high-risk people or think about using it for a high-risk person. And so that would be someone with a family history or someone who has um, a risk factor like having diabetes would be a common one that could be good to know about. Another buzzword sort of thing to know about with um, cardiac ultrasound is if you see an echogenic intracardiac focus, that's um, an ultrasound finding that can correspond with a trisomy 21 and also what it, what it represents um, – sort of pathophys wise is having some cal calcifications in a papillary muscle. So echogenic intracardiac focus, think about associating that with trisomy 21. And then other things that can be evaluated with ultrasound are like, we, as we talked about, you know, at 18 to 20 weeks, you, you, t you do these anatomic ultrasound, you make measurements and you can see things, for example, like abdominal wall um, defects, club foot, cleft lip, and another buzzword sort of thing is a choroid, um, choroid plexus cyst. So the cortex is where you make the CSF in your brain, and the assist can um, form in there, and you associate that with trisomy 18. So those are the main um, ultrasound findings. Now we're moving on um, more to, to um, diagnostic tests. And so in the cutoff for, um, I'm using for diagnostics, if you're talking about actually getting fetal DNA that you can then um, manipulate or do an analysis with. And Non-invasive testing, I think, sort of falls in between screening and diagnostic because it's still recommended or they recommend you offer um, the invasive test after non-invasive test. The chance of, um, of having screening tests that are um, rate, put you at really high risk and then having the non-invasive test indicate that there, there's an aneuploidy, for example, um, and then um, not having a problem on the invasive test are very low. Right. So the non-invasive tests are based on getting fetal DNA that slips into the maternal circulation. It's used for aneuploid screening. You can offer this um, to high-risk patients, but since it's new and hasn't been studied in all the different aspects, you want to use it for um, regular, regular single-fin pregnancy, not multiple gestations. It hasn't been sort of validated in that setup. So for invasive, we're talking about getting DNA to use it for karyotyping, culture it, and for also for fish analysis. And then this is good because it gives you more information than the aneuploid screening. As we talked about with the, the screening, for example, in the first trimester, it's telling you about 18, 21. So the second trimester, quad screen, it's telling you about the aneuploidy in addition to neural tube, de tube defects. But it's not going to tell you anything about Turner's or um, Kleinfelder's or cystic fibrosis or Tay-Sachs. Whereas with the aneuploid, um, with the invasive test, you get some tissue, and then you can um, do analysis of that DNA and, and help make those diagnoses. The risks are, are fairly common, all the invasive things, common meaning that they're similar between them. There's thus loss of the pregnancy, the rupture of membranes, preterm labor, or some injury, um, fetal injury. So we're starting off with chorionic villus sampling, because this is the first one you can do chronologically in a pregnancy. Between 9 and 12 weeks, you can do um, CVS. The idea of what the chorion is, is you have um, the blastocyst form, 
the outer layer of the blast. This is the trophoblast. They'll def differentiate into um, sister trophoblast and cytotrophoblast. You can see that. Um, you can see that over here. And then these um, syncytial and cytotrophoblast implant in the endometrium, and they become a chorion, and that's the um, the fetus's contribution of the placenta. And the chorion has villi that project out of it to make a surface for exchange um, for the maternal circulation, and that's what you're sampling. That's what a chorionic villus sampling is. It's a fetal part of the placenta. Um, and it's done transabdominally or can be done transvaginally. The complication, the general number to keep in your head is 1% or 1 out of 100. You're going to have a problem. And again, this is the earliest, so it can be done in the first trimester, which is beneficial for making um, treatment decisions, lower risk, um, termination of pregnancy. So amniocentesis, you need to wait longer, so you have to wait until 15 weeks. Now you're in the second trimester. The reason you do this is because the, the chorion and the amnion um, need to fuse together before you do amniocentesis. You'd use the needle, insert it transabdominally through the uterus into the amniotic sac, get amniotic fluid, and you also get amniotic fetal cells. So you get um, the fluid, so you can look at that. So you can look at the um, AFP, and you also get cells, so you can do culture, karyotype analysis, and fish. And the complications here, the number to remember is a half, so that's about 1 over 200. And so it's a greater, um, I mean, it's, it's less, um, less risky than chorionic villa sampling. So the early is the chorionic villus sampling. You can do it earlier, but it has a greater risks associated with it. Amniocentesis, you have to wait until 15 weeks, but it has less risk. And finally, the um, percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. Um, this is a done transabdominally, and as the name suggests, you go into the umbilical cord and you get blood. <coughs> and the reason you do this is you want to check hematocrit. For example, you have RH issues, mom's RH negative, and you're concerned about immunization and anemia. You might want to check hematocrit. And um, most importantly is that this gives access to confusion, access for transfusion. And the reason that's most important is because you can also assess for anemia using a Doppler ultrasound. You put it um, on the head, so it's a transcranial Doppler ultrasound. You look at the, um, the um, MC, MCA um, and see the velocity as a, as a proxy for anemia. So you don't need to do this very invasive procedure if you just want to look at anemia. But if you need to get access for transfusion and you want to measure hematocrit, you can do both of those things with the um, percutaneous umbilical blood uh, sampling technique. And since you can also get cells, you can take those and do the karyotype analysis with the fetal cells. And the this is an advanced high-risk um, procedure. So here it's greater than 2%. So it's you know the problems are more frequently than 1 in 50. And the problems, like we said, are about common for all of them. Loss of a pregnancy, rupture of membranes, preterm labor, fetal injury. All right. So as a way of review, some just a few of the key points here. Maternal serum AFP interpretation. Maternal serum AFP is high. What is that telling you? You're thinking about neural tube defects. When it's low, what's it telling you? Or what are you thinking about? You're thinking about trisomies, aneuploidy. Wrong number of chromosomes. What's the earliest invasive diagnostic procedure? So what's the earliest thing if you really need to find out um, the karyotype and genetic status of the fetus? What's the earliest thing you can do? It's a chorionic villus sampling. And then that's at nine weeks at the earliest. And then amniocentesis, you have to wait until 15 weeks. Okay. And then we're going to order the invasive procedures by risk using like one over one over style. So the most risky thing, percutaneous umbilical cord sampling, umbilical blood sampling. So it's, the risk is greater than 1 over 50, very risky. The next most risky is chorionic villus sampling, which is 1 over 100. And then after that, amniocentesis, but 1 over 200 is the least risky. All right. So that is the conclusion of um, this little talk and thanks for watching visit the website for more information or for more videos like this and consider going to 52 kids.org and making a donation thank you